Hello everyone, my name is Gus. Hi, I'm Woody. And today we have a video neither one of us has seen. Mm -mm. Uh, the title of this video is Cave Exploring Gone Wrong. Something that is terrible, obviously. I don't know what this video is about. Well, obviously, has, something went wrong. It has the word TERROR in all caps. Mm. So. That's how you had me at TERROR. So let's, uh, let's start watching and see what's up. Craig and John had big plans to dive into a notorious cave system in Florida. Still, they had no idea how bad things would get on their return trip to this bottomless and hazardous water-filled cave. It's not bottomless. It's deep. This is Eagle's Nest. Right. I hope they show a map. When I don't I haven't seen it. That community sh makes a fatal mistake. Only other cave divers are qualified to this search. Looks like peacock. One of the hardest Well, I'm not sure if this is actual footage. Is that a qualified no. searcher is Doubt usually it. a friend and knows the person they are searching for. That grim fact and an equally sobering responsibility are part of the culture and that's of Central Florida's certified cave divers. Most of them share technical skills, physical prowess, and a love of high adventure in the many freshwater caves of the region. Since 1960, there have been 374 Florida cave diving deaths recorded by International Underwater Cave Rescue and Recovery. Historically, ICR. most of those fatalities were divers who lacked proper training for deep diving in what enthusiasts call an overhead environment. But now, there is growing concern that even veteran cave divers are in unnecessary danger. At the same time, more cave divers are making expeditions into underwater caverns and returning safely. In the end, it's often difficult to say what caused most cave diving deaths because no one is left to tell what actually happened. Mm. However, recent developments in wristband dive computers paint a picture of events. 30 years ago, the small numbers of cave divers in Florida were generally fanatics dedicated to refining their skills. But today, there are many more recreational divers. They may be certified, but only dive once or twice a year, so their skills are not as finely honed. That's right. Craig Simon, 44, of Spring Hill, Florida, was born in Manhattan, New York. He was a very outgoing Italian guy who first heard about scuba diving from a friend in New York City. He researched the sport and was intrigued by every aspect of it. He eventually moved to Florida because he liked the outdoors and wanted to spend more time outside pursuing his passions. I get that. Once in Florida, he quickly filled up his weekends with dives to the many dive sites in the area. Diving was one of Craig's favorite hobbies and eventually he became a certified diver. Craig's dream was to have a career that allowed him to be outside mostly, or at least not be stuck inside an office. Definitely not Florida. His dream career <laughs> came true when he launched a that, landscape business. Not. He firmly believed in his faith and made many not a friends single mouth. through we the St. Francis Cabrini Catholic high. Church of Spring Hill, Florida. He had a wife and three sons who he cherished deeply, and when Craig wasn't diving, he would spend time with his family. Craig took diving very seriously, and after 20 years of experience, he decided to get more serious about cave diving. Hmm. He was quickly accepted into the cave diving community. He made friends with local cave divers Lucky. John Robinson and dive legend Paul Heinrich. Ooh. Craig looked up to Paul's Paul awesome. as a diver because he had a decorated resume, including many cave explorations worldwide. John Robinson, 36, was born and raised on Long Island, New York. John learned to dive while he was earning his master's degree at the University of Florida in the early 1990s. After working in California, he returned to Florida in 2001 and started a career as an electrical engineer. John became a certified cave diver went to the and same, went cave diving uh, every school weekend. School of uh, camera he was holding known that you to went be to. highly technical and methodical in his good. approach to diving. His friends <laughs> would even go as far to make fun of him for the obsessive way he maintained his diving gear. He was very careful about his equipment because living in Florida, he heard stories of cave divers having an issue underwater and not making it out. Nevertheless, he was intrigued about exploring Eagle's Nest and went diving in the underwater caves in the area to prepare for an adventure to go there one day. Even though John took diving seriously, it still scared his parents. They knew that even though John was very good at it, accidents do happen and cave diving accidents usually meant the worst. However, John's life passion was cave diving, so there was no way mm -hmm. he would stop. So it's I, tough I just wanted this part. 
Yeah. Uh, you go ahead. You go first. I just I'll... wanted to add some context for people who are watching this video who are not familiar with some of the videos we've reacted to in the past. This is definitely not the first Eagle's Nest related video that we react to. But if you're watching this video and it's the first time, Eagle's Nest is considered the Mount Everest of underwater caves. It's located in Florida. Woody and I have dived there. You've dived more than me there. Um, your 100th cave dive was in Eagle's Nest. Which was cool, but um, I, you know, I worry sometimes that people feel like Eagle's Nest is this death trap that anyone who goes in, it's like 50-50 chance of death. You know, it's not the case. There have been a lot of fatalities there, but the main reason for it is that once you put that label on something called the Mount Everest of anything, obviously people are, gonna, are going to check it out. And it's a deep cave, really massive. That's why none of the videos that we've been watching have been of Eagle's Nest. I know this because in Eagle's Nest, you can, you can drive a 747 through the passages. Like, it's that big. It's just, hum everything is massive at Eagle's Nest. Um, so, because of it, I think people get in trouble. Yeah, and also the depth. It's just the depth. Eagle's Nest is deep quickly. Yeah. And I think that is highly unusual for certainly the Florida caves that I've been in. Basically, right from the start, you just go straight down. And I think the bottom of that is like below 150, right? Could be 160 or 160. No, it's a little bit shallower because it's a pile. It's like this. So you, you hit the yeah. cone of the pile. So because of it, it's shallow. And then you drop fast. Shallow, like 40 meters, 130 feet, something yeah. like that, 115. It's shallow. But then it goes down to 320, yeah, almost quickly, 100 meters. Quickly, yeah, it does. So where I'm struggling, where I continue to struggle is that if you if you listened to what he said, it's it's painting a picture that it's the caves and cave diving that is so deadly. And and we are trying on this channel to constantly convey it's not being properly prepared, not being properly trained. That is so deadly. Frankly, it yeah. would be just as deadly if you went and dove one of the deep 300 foot wrecks off the, in the ocean of South Florida. It would be just as deadly if you didn't prepare for that. We were actually so, joking around because you had a malfunction. You've had a malfunction twice that I can think of inside caves that being inside the cave made it safer to have the problem that you had. Both times you had an inflation, right? An, in, an inflation issue. Yes. And because we cave dive, in a lot of cases, we go in deco. If you were in the ocean and your wing starts to inflate out of control and you can deflate her or you have a problem, there's some kind of problem that skyrockets you to the surface. You can die, right? But both times that have happened to you in the past, and it wasn't even the same rig, you were limited by the ceiling of the cave. Yeah. So we were able to resolve it before you even hit the ceiling. But even if it was completely out of control, you would have been safe because you were in a cave. <laughs> it, yes. And, and and this isn't to boast on myself. Did I seem panicked? No. Did I, was I freaking out to right. you? Was I floundering all over the place? You see, right. the training kicks in where you're like, I have a problem, but I'm fine for the most part. Yeah. And that's where it keeps coming back over and over again in the years we've been doing dive talk to the training. Yep. Don't go in any caves, not Eagle's Nest or any others without the proper training. Don't go in Eagle's Nest until you have 100 cave dives like they recommend. Like, you know, just follow these rules. And I think a lot of this stuff can be avoided. But anyway. And it's not just the training, right? Because the rules of cave diving, which we've covered several times in the show before, also talk about equipment. Like if you are Paul Heinerth, like the world's greatest cave diver, it doesn't matter who you are, right? If you don't have the proper equipment, you can die. If you go in with a single tank and your first stage fails, you're dead. And I it, don't care how much training you have. That's all right. Right. I mean, it's pretty basic. You can't come to the surface in a cave whenever you want That's so right. just think about that if you can't come to the surface whenever you want you really want to have a plan b and mm. c and d and that's what the training is all about so 
let's yep. just stay focused on that and while we're watching this. A friend, and they instantly hit it off. They spend endless time talking about diving and the technical aspects, eventually leading them to start diving together. This they went on many dives and became like great friends while their first year river. of diving together. Mm -hmm. One day, they had a close call in a cave, which made them both realize how easy it was to die in a cave. John had a panic attack in the water-filled cave and almost drowned. Craig was able to calm him down and safely escort him back to the surface. Why did he have a both panic attack? Well, I do agree. That's what I said. They got lucky. Panicking is... They were shaken up from the incident no bueno. and took some time off from diving to recalibrate. Eventually, they were ready for their next adventure. Craig and John wanted to return to one of their favorite sites, the Eagle's Nest cave system. God. They had both dived there before, and this was the cave that they had the close call in, so they spent extra time preparing for this expedition. And I'm sorry if I missed Craig's this. Are they cave divers? Are they trained cave divers? I very, I could have missed that, everybody, so don't shoot me. You know what? I don't know if I, if I heard that they were cave divers. I, I think they said... Earlier in the video, divers. I yeah, they were experienced divers, and they wanted to spend more time cave diving. But I'm not really sure. Now, they he mentioned Paul Heinrich, so I assume Paul certified these dudes, maybe. But I don't think okay. they had the experience like a hundred cave dive to go to Eagle's Nest. That's for sure. I mean, we know a lot of experienced divers yeah. that call themselves experienced. You know, they're they're typically in like a Buddha type position. How many probably would not do well in Eagle's Nest? How many cave divers? Do you that you know that have a hundred plus dives, so experienced cave divers, not brand new. You think are prone to panic in a cave when they have an issue. That you know. You know, among our group that we dive with, I, can't name um, a I, I, one. I don't think they would panic. After a hundred cave dives, it's like they catastrophic just, failures. He's like, okay, I Bella. If they up. ran out of air and they were far away from us. They would be swimming quickly, if yeah. you want to call that panic, which yeah. I don't, to get air. Yeah. But no. I mean, I, I really can't. Think can't. Of it. Yeah. So if these I guys were panicking in a cave, they probably didn't have the right experience to go in. I pro I'm probably wrong, but the way he's making it sound. I have once witnessed... A diver in training. Yeah. I was there on a class just being like the, the, the mock lost diver panic. Yeah, yeah. That I saw. But they were, they were trying to become cave divers. He was trying to become a cave diver, yeah. and he was definitely in a panicked mode. That's a rude To awakening. calm himself down, he yeah. had to just, from what I kind of remember, go to the side, hold the side of the cave, and literally was like panicking. Well, it, it's and it all depends, obviously, where you get trained. I think that if you get trained in Mexico where there's no flow and the cave is massive and stuff, it's a lot easier to not panic. But in Florida, right, sometimes for most people, their very first cave dive, very first one ever, is going in through the eye a genie. That's tough. And you're pulling yourself through rocks or the against e the, the ear, current. The ear. The ear or the eye. You're putting yourself into this cave that's trying to spit you out and that's your very first cave dive a lot of people can't take it like it's like okay dude like whoa that was way more than i thought i remember my my first time after being certified going into the ear because <laughs> i got certified in the abacus that yeah, don't have no that flow right and then I went into the ear and i i think i had gone in the ear before into the cavern zone after uh -huh. cavern class yeah you know, it was a reminder that this Oof. this is this is Slaps big time. In the face. Anyway, yeah, let's go. Tim, not to dive with John because of the previous incident. She knew that John was experienced and known to be an excellent diver, but still, the accident hit too close to home, and she was terrified it would happen again. Craig promised his wife that he would not go with John again because of the incident, but he changed his mind a week before the dive was planned when John told him that everyone else refused to dive with him. Craig was great friends with John and trusted him. Not to mention, John taught him much of what he knew. Before that incident, John had always been cautious and very safe. Paul Heinrich knew Craig and John and was happy to see their passion for cave diving. Wow. They both Paul thought very young. highly of Paul Let's and loved around. hearing his adventure stories. Let's listen, he made Paul owned Scuba West Dive Shop Talk in Hudson, Florida, train. and had dived Eagle's Nest since the 1970s. 
He knew the risks entering the system because of his many trips inside. He is a diver education pioneer in open water and cave diving. He has been instructing for the National Association of Cave Divers and the National Speleological Society Cave Diving Section for over 36 years. Paul has all the accolades you could ever dream of in diving and cave diving. He has held world records for deep cave penetration and is credited with many cave discoveries. National Geographic has covered his work in Florida, Mexico, the Bahamas, and Antarctica. As a result, he is known internationally and is one of the best to ever do it. That being said, That's even true. Paul is hesitant whenever he enters the Eagle's Nest cave system. I don't know about that. Eagle's Nest is known for its expansive deep caverns and is one of the most challenging underwater dive sites. Suppose I mean, we're hanging on every word. I don't know about hesitant, and I know we're hanging on every word. Right, right, right. Paul would be, I'm going to plan according right. to the level of technical depth and so forth that Eagle's Nest has. Yep. Hesitant? No. Plan no. properly? Yes. For sure. Safe, for sure. For whatever reason, in that case, it could be very hard to navigate the twists and turns of the passages. Most trips into the cave last around an hour. As a rule, divers save about a third of their tanks of air in case of emergencies. You could go the wrong way for a distance if you go down the wrong passage. If you lose track of the line, you spend time having to find that line. Given the depth, even a tiny mistake can be pretty unforgiving. The gas in your tank doesn't last very long and you can become panicked. Divers say that nearly 300 feet below the ground in utterly dark, any mistake can be your last. This is a deep cave and it is not for beginners. True. Even with many years of experience diving in this cave, you are still taking a risk by entering it. Map by Expert check. divers regard Eagle's Nest as a system of many dangers because of its deep network of tunnels and chambers with heavy silt and mud deposits. It has claimed several lives. Eagle's Nest is more extensive than most. It's deeper than most and is an extraordinary cave. This attracts cave divers worldwide to the murky pond north of Tampa, Florida. This cave offers entrance to 5,655 feet of passageways through a long chimney that opens into a spectacular cathedral-sized cavern. It is unlike anything a diver has ever seen before. This Down below, like however, is more than a mile of passages. The deepest of them, 300 feet, presents a technical challenge. The beauty of the chambers, such as the main ballroom, which is 400 feet long and 200 feet across, inspires awe. If the visibility is clear, you can see the sun coming down through the chimney. It's absolutely beautiful. Yep. Correct. Because of that chimney, right, that you go through that tunnel that you saw them going down, and because the ballroom is so big, which he mentioned is a cathedral style, but I would say a bit, very big cathedral, right? When you are on the far end of this cathedral in this ballroom, the sun coming through the hole that you came through, that chimney, looks like like if a tile is missing on like a really, really up high ceiling. It's like this tiny hole, like, oh, we came through that. Mm -hmm. It's that big. It's mm -hmm. humongous. You know, one thing he mentioned earlier, I'll just say this really quick. He said, John was an excellent diver. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I think people miss about cave diving is that cave diving is completely different. You can be an excellent diver, like an instructor. You can be really good at teaching even instructors how to teach people how to dive and be terrible at cave diving. It's different. It's like saying like, oh, well, she's a very good di uh, driver or he's a very good driver. They've never crashed a car. They've never even had a ticket. And then compare that to racing a Formula One car. Like it's not comparable. It's, it's two different skills. So being an excellent diver doesn't mean you should be a cave diver. That's not how that works. It's two separate different things. The same is applicable to wreck diving. Like the people that go inside wrecks and go to the engine rooms and stuff like that. You can be an excellent diver and you should definitely stay away from the inside of a wreck. Greg and John used a mixture of chemicals that would allow them two and a half hours of air in the cave. They wanted to explore the far reaches of the downstream tunnels of Eagle's Nest. Their dive plan called for 40 minutes from the beginning of their descent to the ascent out of the cave. Hmm. This included decompression. Decompression what? is the slow ascent needed to avoid the air bubbling up in the veins called the bends. 
They were going to make it to about 1,800 feet inside the cave passages and go to a maximum depth of 300 feet. No chance. Their total air supply would last an estimated two and a half hours. They were equipped with plenty yep. of air for the trip in Multi case hour. anything went Dive. wrong. They had high quality dive scooters allowing them to move through the passages much faster than regular swimming. Yep. The scooters made it possible to go very deep into the cave. They also brought stage tanks, which are extra air bottles that they would use for decompression. Mm -hmm. Good. They were both equipped with wristband dive computers, which provide real-time dive information that they need to dive well. Craig and John met at the cave Saturday, June 12, 2004, and entered Eagle's Nest at about 1 p.m. On their way down the first cave passage, they staged their decompression tanks and then made their way deeper into the cave. They descended about 40 feet, squeezed their way through the chimney compared to the narrow part of an hourglass, and into the ballroom, also known as the entrance room. This is the 150 foot wide chamber, with large passages leading to both upstream and downstream. Those are the two from. major sections of the cave. Craig and John follow the downstream tunnel, which descends gradually to a depth of 200 feet, before dropping steeply down the What's pit to 290 bell? feet, then <laughs> into a series of Air large bell. rooms and passages. They plan to spend some time exploring the rooms beyond the pit, and then make their way back out with a decompression stop at 200 feet and another in the entrance room. They made their way to John's pocket, one of the cave's most constricting parts. This place is extremely claustrophobic and is closet sized. Craig veered away from the guideline to see if the narrow part of John's pocket was an uncharted tunnel. Some time later, the divers had not returned to their pre-planned check-in time at 3.30 p.m. A nearby diver, also diving Eagle's Nest, noticed Craig and John did not make their check-in. Their lack of check-in immediately sent off alarm bells for the diver, and he also saw that their stage bottles were not used. Mm. He became concerned and searched inside of the entrance of Eagle's Nest. There was no sign of Craig or John anywhere, so he called for help. After receiving the call for help shortly after 3.30 p.m. Saturday, members of the Pasco and Citrus County underwater recovery teams and volunteers descended into the mouth of Eagle's Nest and began searching for Craig and John. Once they realized conditions were beyond their ability, they called on certified cave divers ready to plunge into the 70 degree water. Yeah. About 40 rescue divers showed up to conduct the search. Some who drove onto the state owned lands became stuck in deep water and dirt on the way over. Others, said to be relatives of Craig, were ferried through the back countrysides of Florida in SUVs and pickup trucks. It was a complicated and technically challenging operation. Paul Heinrich personally told Craig's family he would find him and John. Paul tries not to think of the logistics of diving once he has begun a search. He focuses on the mission and turns off the wondering part of his mind. Paul entered the cave with determination to find his friends. He made his way through the cave quickly but carefully while keeping an eye out for Craig and John. He was deep in the system now and entered John's pocket. He scanned the room and an unsettling feeling overcame him as he shined his light across the floor. Paul's light caught the stainless clip of a diving scooter mostly buried in the cave's silty floor. It was feeling. John's. Right next to it was his body. John's pocket is about 1,100 feet into the cave on the main line in the downstream tunnel. John's scooter and other gear were operational, but his air tanks were empty. Support divers entered the room and helped remove John's body from the cave. Larry Green inspected John's computer and determined that he could have gotten confused by the silt kicked up from the cave floor and could not have managed to find an exit and swam around in the room unsure of where to go and was ultimately unable to get out. He was trapped. Couldn't find the John's line. body was found in a position where he was heading out of the cave. Paul Heinrich and a partner feet, had found feet. John on one of their first dives. The other rescue divers searched all over, but there was no sign of Craig. It was strange that they were not next to each other. They ended up suspending the search another day due to severe lightning and thunderstorms. The divers also needed some time to rest because the operation would get even more dangerous without it. The break allowed them time to regroup and decompress from the deep dive search attempts. After returning from a trip to see friends, John's parents received the news of their son's death from the sheriff's deputy. They resumed the search to find Craig Monday afternoon. 
This operation was dangerous for the rescuers. Suppose divers go more than 100 feet below the surface with compressed air rather than a mix that includes helium. In that case, they are very vulnerable to the disorienting effects of nitrogen narcosis, yep. which is caused by a small amount of nitrogen that builds up in the diver's body, causing a painful, sometimes deadly condition. During the search, rescue diver Larry Green suffered decompression sickness after diving 300 feet on three consecutive days. Mm. He was treated in a decompression chamber overnight and released the next day. Divers had planned to conduct a more extensive search, diving deeper into the cavernous area about 300 feet below ground. They prepared for an operation that could take between six to eight hours. The two-person teams performed several more dives that day, but the rescuers found no trace of Craig. Rain delayed the next day's search until 5 p.m. as Craig's family gathered at the muddy edge of the dive site and grew increasingly wow. anxious. Very detailed. Paul did not give up on the search for Craig. He took a different route once he got past John's pocket and saw Craig's body suspended in water tangled in the guideline. Paul didn't see a guideline when he found Craig's scooter, though that doesn't mean one wasn't there. Paul said, when you have a scooter, it is very tempting just to go and take a quick look at something without running a line. That's really but, true. But, unfortunately, something could have happened to kick up silt, and things could have gone wrong fast after that. After yeah. Paul found Craig, during the long ascent, he was deeply saddened for Craig's wife and four children. Close friends of lost divers have a hard time joining in the search, and for good reason. There are a lot of theories about what went wrong, but the truth will likely remain in that deep, deadly cavern. Investigators did not think John died from faulty equipment. Paul Heinrich said it as a reminder that you can't stray from the basic rules, as tempting as it may be. He thinks the drowning for Craig and John was an accident. Unbelievable that it ended. It ended with him saying exactly what we said. Yeah pretty close in this you may error you made an error let's just say it's an it's a it's you broke one of the rules it's a breaking of a rule and i'm oh man i i we've been saying this for so many times and i'm wondering i'm wondering how it's coming across i think i think a lot of times it's coming across that we are oh no the dive talk guys are reviewing our video they're just going to point out everything that went wrong and they think they're better than everybody else. They never make mistakes. We are not very experienced cave divers. Right. I'm going to say I don't think we are. Of course we don't. Not. We don't do it enough. Right. You know, right. we both have more than a hundred. And we make mistakes every and dive. And we make mistakes. So I, I just want to get rid of that. It's, it's just that. I feel like we enjoy watching these videos as much as we enjoy bringing them to you because we also learn from them by having a dive talk discussion <laughs> about these things. So if you're watching this, two things. One, don't you tell us not to talk so much. We're <laughs> definitely not the right channel for you. Like we're not here to play the video and then not talk. All right. So that's easy. Don't watch it. Watch the documentary. Don't watch us. But um, I don't want them to think that we think. Because in the background, they don't know you and I. Mm -hmm. We know each other. We're constantly telling each other how uh, much we learn from the great cave divers. We aren't that. Sure. Because we don't do it enough. I don't live in cave country. I think you've really got to be doing this regularly. What I do want to say to wrap this up is it's just very unforgiving. So Eagle's nest for sure. Eagle's nest and, and, and other caves are unforgiving because of the fact you simply can't come to the surface. Right. That's the purpose of our channel is to talk about what went wrong. We're not saying we would not have made the same exact mistakes that they made. Right. So I, I just, I thought about that while this was playing and that we're talking and we're pointing out or we're hung up on every word that this guy says, but we want to be, we want to, we want to better ourselves, better the community, but we know that 
many of you that watch this channel are way more experienced. Maybe you were instructors of ours that saw how bad we were when we took your class. Right. right? We aren't. I'm not a natural at this. It's mm. really hard every time I go cave diving because I haven't been in a month or so and I got to get get my balance back and so forth. So take this in the spirit of humbleness. Yeah. That's the purpose of our channel. And like you said, I think we can learn from, you know, these accidents. Yeah. And it is true that it is impossible for us to get the truth of what happened from the people that perished during the accident because they're dead. But there is a lot of research and, and investigation that happens after these accidents take place. And we can learn a lot from the gear that we find and the computers um, that capture everything that happened. Because if you find somebody, I mean, you don't have to know everything to know that, look, I found somebody 10 minutes, the die 10 minutes into the dive because they stopped breathing. If the computers are monitoring your sac or whatever, your breathing rate, and you stop breathing, I can tell, okay, they were diving for 10 minutes. Their tanks have air. They have the right gas in them because you can analyze the gas to make sure they had the right gas. And you can also see the PO2 tracking, the level of oxygen in their bodies tracking by the computer. So you can tell like, okay, there was, doesn't seem like there was foul play or oversight. So this was probably like a cardiac arrest. They had a heart attack on their water. And then sometimes you can see that, wow, they were breathing all the way until they ran out of air. So you can tell, okay, well, these people were alive. Until, like, there's a lot that you can learn by analyzing the evidence, just like in many murders, right? You watch even the movies. It's like, okay, this guy was hit with a bat because of the splash of blood on the wall or whatever. Like, you can construct, you know, pretty accurate, I would say, what happened based on the information that we find. Also, wh while you were talking, it was making me think of why why don't they just close all these caves down and shut down all of this stuff in the state of Florida, prevent all of this, and then these issues wouldn't have anymore. And I thought, I think about that a lot. Hmm. I think that imagine if we then just say, I think we should make motorcycles illegal. Right. Why don't we take all cigarettes and make them just illegal? That Forget about Kill regulation. So just get rid of them. Right. Why don't we act blah, blah, blah. You see. On and on and on. I, 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 don't, I don't like that. Just take away, like remove freedom. In fact, pretty much. I mean, I don't want to get off on a bad discussion and then we really have no viewers left. But there's <laughs> many things I would remove restrictions from. Because I think that we don't, we want to be, we want to be responsible and we want to pursue our activity, or if you want to call this a sport, an adventure, and we want to be better and we want to self regulate it. I don't want others to dictate that for us. Yeah. So, well, so I don't think that that's right. That we, that those of you who think this is crazy and insane automatically cast judgment that the state should stop this. You know what? I want illegal. that right. Don't take that away from me, but I should do it right. You should hold me accountable for doing it right. That's, that's right. fair. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. But as long as Eagle's Nest is there and as long as people call it the Mount Everest of cave diving, it will be attractive to people that want to go there. I mean, I've seen discussions on Facebook groups where people are like, do you think it's cool if I go to the ballroom at Eagle's Nest? Like, I'm not a cave diver. I no. only have a single tank, but let me just check it out or whatever. No. That is inviting trouble, right? And people do go to the ballroom and they swim around clueless with just a single tank. And as a matter of fact, we actually reacted to a video of several divers who did that. And boy, it was stressful. But in case you haven't seen that one, I'm going to leave it right here. People do go into the ballroom, swim around like it's a shallow dive in a beautiful reef in Indonesia. I wish they wouldn't. Bye, everybody.